Welcome back to Film Fanatics, where we talk about the movies and today's shows that have us obsessed, excited, and inspired. And I'm Gal. And I'm Alan. And today we have a special spoiler review for Dare to See the greatest TV show of our generation, Succession. Joining us is possibly Succession's biggest fan, at least that we can find. He's a returning guest and our good friend, Alex, the host, Alex Trebek Helmer. Uh, from the League of Cinephiles TLOC Productions. Welcome, Alex. I know Talking Succession is your favorite thing in the world. That is not a hyperbole. That is literally my favorite thing to talk about <laughs> in all the world. So I'm um, happy to be back, Alan and Gall. Um, and yeah, like you guys said, there's no better kind of topic to have me on back on, I feel like, than I have, I've been a huge fan of the show for like years at this point. And I've considered it my favorite TV show that's currently running for a while. So I'm happy to have you because I know you agree with me in that uh, in that sense. And uh, yeah, how are you feeling now that it's over? Because uh, I have a gigantic hole in my heart. That and that last at the same time was something that I wasn't expecting. Um, so fortunately, I guess unfortunately, because I'm not getting the same joy out of it that everyone else is. I don't watch Ted Lasso or Barry, but I will get on that right away. Um, so I, I do not watch Ted Lasso. Lasso. Yeah, so I feel like... I need to get to did. Barry. I'm watching yeah. Ted Lasso now. Yeah, so I would have that same level of dread that everyone else is having. Um, it is sad. I'm marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Um, but they did tell us a season in advance that it was ending, so I, you know, I, I was able to prepare my trauma, my grief, unlike Roman. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Just as soon as I started the final season... In that first episode where we go months after uh, they get sort of cut out of the Gojo deal by Logan at the end of season three. I was already feeling this was going to be at least one of the best seasons of TV that I'd watched. Just the flow of it and um, the way that the way that it builds this world. I think like from the start, the way that it depicts the lavish world of the rich like in a very, I guess, inviting way, like almost romanticizing way, it sort of shows you why these people are so attracted to this power and this world. They, they do an amazing job of bringing you into that and making it fascinating, but also being very critical of it. And then just as a whole, I felt like, you know, after the gut punch of episode three, I felt like um, after, well, sp- now we're getting to spoilers after Kendall takes on the job with Roman. There's this feeling of dread of do they really got it or is it about to fall apart? Yeah, I feel like this is something that the series is so good at. And like, you never know what's going to happen. Like, you can guess it, but it's pretty hard to be 100% sure because they give you like these nuggets of like happy moments and like, uh, moments that you're like, oh, okay, it's okay for me to root for these horrible people, and then like they're like, no, 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 it's uh, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get their happy ending. So, and uh, yeah, so it, and it does that repeatedly. Like, um, I think the moment that got me this season was in episode three when all the siblings uh, embraced. Uh, that killed me. Like, um, you know, knowing that they lost their father and like they probably felt like the worst they ever felt in their lives, but they were together for that. So like that, that's something that you not usually think you're going to get from from a show like Succession, but we know that we can because the writing is that good. So, And I think it was so poetic um, that Tom watches Logan die and none of the kids are there for it. It's such a, like if you had told me that in the beginning of season four, it wouldn't have been what I expected at all. Like, even though, you know, they're not great people, I was so emotional. I don't cry often, but I got really close, especially with uh, with Roman's reaction and how Shiv immediately fell apart when she heard that um, that he was about to die. Yeah. And kind of, kind of adding on top of that, I think the best element of this show, and I think what's so impressive about it is the way it humanizes its quote-unquote monsters, um, in a way where, you know, you can say, oh, every character in this uh, in the show is terrible. But then it's like, OK, well, then why did Alan cry? Why did Gull, you know, cry? So mm-hmm. I think that's yeah. the kind of the best part of the show is that, you know, I think um, it's the picture that it paints is not black and white. And there's kind of layers to everything. 
Um, also, when you're talking about kind of the way it paints the world and culture today, I think it's just very kind of a realistic world. And it's not something that kind of beats you over the head with like cultural references and stuff, but it uses kind of current events um, and figures in order to kind of further the narrative and further characters as well. And I think that's my favorite part of the show is that it's so timely, but I also feel like um, I feel like almost like in the 19 set, I think 1976, we got the movie network. I think this is basically mm -hmm. this culture's network. Right. Um, and I think generations to come, I think I'll be able to show my kids this and their kids, they can show their kids this and it'll still be relevant. Yeah. It's, it's like it's timeless in that way. Right. Cause, uh, it is as much as they reference the real world in some way, it's mostly like, um, not a fantasy, but like it's, it's clearly like a scripted show, so like um, in a good way. So, uh, so yeah, I agree with you. I think we can show this to like our grandkids, and it will be just as impactful. Also, like being an American, episode eight was uh, yeah. a little well. It hit kind of close to home, especially with um, an entire political side claiming a couple years ago that the election was stolen, or um, well, that's the situation right now that had happened. <laughs> There you go. It's going on everywhere. Or uh, I know you and me, Alan, listen to the Succession podcast. And I listen to it too. It was an elections consultant. Yeah, yeah. Where he talked about like the shadow of the 2000 election. Um, yeah. And so it just showed how, um, how like the top 1% get to live in this bubble where they believe that they can bend reality to their will. And that's with like, like financial influence, literally, mm. in this yeah. show. I completely agree with what Gall said. It also shows how kind of the oligarchical kind of elements of the system and why like technically we live in democracy, but in a democracy, but it's also like, are we? <laughs> like the fact that elections um, are really kind of the powers held in the hands of a few rather than, you know, the majority. And that is painted in um, kind of episode eight that Gall mentioned how it's just these few, you know, selected people who are deciding the, basically the fate of the entire country. Um, and I think that was uh, super effective. And the reasons why, too, the reasons why in terms of, you know, a deal going through or not. And I think yeah, they, um, they, they yeah. it was like they're playing all, with a dollhouse. But it's democracy. It, was, it was more mm -hmm. like basically like uh, like winning a, uh, a piss contest, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. between like three siblings. So, yeah, that's that's, like great. And that's actually very great. realistic. After that episode, I went to Alden. I was like, they just caused the apocalypse. It, I, I agree with that as well. And um, not just that kind of Roman and Ken don't really care about the after effects, but also you see it um, from more political point of view. Mencken, when you see him in a couple episodes later, you realize, oh, this is pretty much, he's nothing like he seems like on TV making that big like emperor-esque speech. And so it's yeah. almost that element of politics being kind of like a showmanship type thing where it's like you give the people kind of what they want. And it's also like he promises, you know, as as I, he, he's a Republican, right? So as a Republican, he's supposed to be against like regulation and all of that. But also he promises Roman that they'll stop the Gojo deal, which is totally against kind of his neoliberal beliefs. Um, and so I feel like that aspect of kind of politics, again, like also following the money and following kind of where your kind of backers um, and interest groups are. I think that's so realistic. And it's, uh, yeah, I just feel like kind of, succession not kind of showing the power under the shadows rather than up front i think that's where it you yeah. know pun intended succeeds i think and let's I talk a little about like uh he didn't block the deal like he told him mm -hmm. like yeah exactly it. and yeah. right away he didn't do it. and yeah. like he's also he not technically both sides not technically president elect who was gonna win yeah because he knew president he pending needed, like fox news quote unquote yeah in season three he's like leading the rebel alliance and he's convicted that he's not Logan. He's he's had this hero complex this whole time. He's the best one with the job, and he's going to reform the world. But we see when he actually gets to it in this season that he's a lot like his father that he'll ever admit. Because whenever it comes to the greater interests of things or him holding on to that power or that throne, he usually goes for himself. And then he also manages to convince his siblings as to why he should be the one in the chair. And he makes a pretty good case for it, actually, in, uh, in the season finale. Because Roman just broke down in, like, the most public way possible. 
So nobody's going to back him in this world of like interest and, and, uh, and appearances. And she is a woman. And for these people, that's a problem, apparently. So like, uh, and she's also pregnant, which makes it like even worse for people like that. Like they, they can't compute that, that a pregnant woman would be able to like be the CEO of this, in, this insane organization. This is all like dinosaurs that we're talking about here. So like when you see that boardroom, they would, they would never elect Shiv as the CEO. So like, I think as much as ego, is egotistical of him, I think he was right. He was the only possible choice of the right. All I want to say was he was right. But I think as we saw in the finale, Shiv just couldn't stomach him, you know, like getting what he wants, gloating about it. And that's part of why, you know, like she loves him, but she did have a bit of, she still wanted to be the most successful one out of the three because she's been groomed her whole life into thinking, nah, you're, you are a woman. Woman equals bad. Like that's, that's her upbringing. Yeah. So, yeah. So I agree and disagree with what Gall said. Um, so kind of I'll elaborate in a sec. First of all, I can, I find the whole kind of tragedy behind Ken to be so, I don't know, both so, um, interesting and both so i don't know tear inducing um he was my horse to back the as i me and golf me spoke too. about it the entire show my number one boy from the, from the and, first episode um, when he's wrapping exactly. that car I'm, yeah. i was rooting for him right away yeah um, i remember when he I, turned on his dad in the end of the second season yeah i was like let's go let's go yeah no 100 percent. and this after the finale kind of harking back to that vote of no confidence which i would argue is like the first huge moment in the show um, but I, I think what ultimately, and I think Roman said it in the finale, and I think what's they didn't hearken on it until the finale, and I love that what when they did that, it's that all these people are full of bullshit, and Waystar, Waystar is a bullshit company, um, and I think uh, like Roman said that, and for Roman to say that, um, I think that's kind of like really that shows a lot. Um, the fact that Ken, I love him, and it hurts me to say this, but he is full of bullshit, right? He's he a guy he says yeah. things, he makes plans, he makes up numbers. Um, he recruits people and it's all bullshit. It's not real. Um, and I think it's part of him trying to be more like his dad and trying more to be that killer. Um, but I still think, um, and I think I, that this is where I disagree with Gall is that I don't think Shiv stopped Ken. And I think th this is a big debate raging online, right? Cause I'm seeing a bunch of people saying, Oh, I hate Shiv. I hate this. I hate that. Um, and then a lot of people also saying, you know, I, I, I support what she did. Um, but I think the reason she, what she did, what she did was because she, not because she couldn't stomach her brother being more successful than her, but because she couldn't stomach him as a person, period. Um, the fact that number one, he killed yeah. someone. Number two, the fact that, again, like I said, he's like, he. I feel like he would be good as CEO, but again, he's not real. And he's not- I think the Minkin thing just played a huge part yeah. in it. She was like, she saw the bullshit yeah. part. And he's putting, exactly. he's, he's putting his feet on the desk when he's on, when he's sitting in Logan's chair and everything. That's what I mean. Um, that's and, when he lost her, I think. Yeah. If you see her reaction to that, you that that's when you know like she's she's yeah. not gonna go. Through. That's exactly what I meant. The feet on the desk. And, um, um, I love him. Yeah, I, love him. I feel and, like really a lot of people yeah. in that world are bullshit. Yeah, and they're very successful at it, which is why I think you're right when you say like he yeah. would be successful probably. He'll probably hire people that were, that were better than him with with this other stuff, you know, pre he'll pretend he, he's the one that came up with everything. But also, um, Waystar is a bullshit company. Like, I feel like exactly. no, it's like a, it's a successful company, but also, you know, phony news, um, failed movie studio. Um, they're not trusted by 50% of the American public. Um, so I feel like at the end of the day, as of Lester. because again, Waystar has been painted as this golden palace, but at the same time, there are so, uh, the cruises shit, I mean, come on. Um, uh, I think there's so yeah, many. Yeah, and then they hire like an interim cubbies. female CEO for like a couple months. Yeah. It's very performative. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, just the fact, even Madsen said it, it's spare parts, right? And um, yeah. yeah, so at the end of the day, it's kind of a false crown. Yeah. Um, speaking of, uh, this is something that I do not predict would happen. But Tom Worms Guns, which is a name that I hate saying, but I love the guy, uh, actually won the whole thing. I would he lived up to the W in his last name. Show. In the last few seasons, it has been 
a little bit like of an easier sell than it was in the beginning of the show. Um, but I love that he won and then he won without Greg. Because I thought if if one of them won, it would be like a power play from both of them. And I'm glad that, um, first of all, Greg got totally called up on his bullshit, on his snaking. Because he was playing not even two sides. He was playing like eight sides to try to get the... Get, I think he really actually just wanted to be the successor, the, the successor, and um, it blew up in his face. And uh, now he's gonna be, have to be Tom's bitch for the rest of his life. So, I think Greg was always yeah, playing all sides because in in uh in season three, he was also helping Kendall with the rebellion, but then he was hanging out and like the the picking the presidents, whatever it was, he was always snooping around everywhere. And Tom, it's such an interesting, it frames the story in such an interesting way that he won. And I think it's very, it leaves you empty, like you guys said. It leaves you maybe even disgusted, but I I thought it was perfect because you see him in the beginning and he's dating Shiv, but he's always attracted to this lavish. He wants to be there with the suit. He wants to to feel important. He has an empty handshake Uh, and he, he learns to imitate. He learns to kiss ass. And that's how he wins by kissing Madsen's ass the best he can, and uh, and by and even she's like without noticing, life. basically sells him the idea. Like she's talking to Madsen, she's like, "This is the biggest kiss that you're ever gonna find, uh, and if you want anyone to suck you off, just ask Tom." <laughs> and uh, and I love how direct Lucas is. He's like, she "I want to made him CEO in that scene. She was trying to." Kind of like save the the father of her child, while still keeping her power as the CEO, and she just shot herself in the foot. And I think she might think that this is kind of like a win for her, that she at least gets to be like. She gets to be in it in a way because like she should be the wife of the CEO, which I think it's it's so bad for her actually because she built up this thing that she would be like the you know like the girl boss and all that and she has like the worst toxic traits of that kid and um and then like she ends up being like the wife of the the ceo i feel like that's like just such a slap in the face for her uh i feel like she would rather even have nothing than have that because um just being like a trophy wife or something like that i feel like that's like the worst face she, she could get and perhaps she wanted just the best life for her child. There's also that conversation. Yeah. I'm going to hark and or hop back on the Tom argument. I have a lot to say here because let's fucking go. I was on Team Tom since the fucking beginning. Everyone was shitting on him. Literally everyone online, the shift heads, just people in general. Oh, Tom's <laughs> never going to get there. At the end of season three, people are hating him. People hated Tom. Like, I've met so many people who hate Tom. I hated Tom in the end of season yeah, three. Yeah, well, fuck you. Exactly. People well, like Shiv Loki deserved that at the end. Shiv Loki um, deserved that. She- I, I, I was I on hated, t- Team Tom. I hated the, from, her mom more than I hated him. In the oh, yeah. Before. I'll talk about that. In a, but Tom, I was on Team Tom since the very beginning. People are shitting on him. This season, people are shitting on him. After Logan died, shitting on him. You know, he's going to get fired. Not just fans, but the particular characters, which I find most interesting about Tom being CEO. He Since, he's, since the earliest season, what is Tom? The humble servant. He says that to everyone. I'm just a humble servant. I'm just a humble servant, right? He's just there to serve. Um, and there are moments, remember in season four, where Ken and Roman are literally threatening to fire Tom with him, like, like in a room right next to him. And he can like on the airplane when he's like, Oh, when they're like, shape, Oh, we can fire Tom. He's interchangeable. You know, if that makes you feel better. And for him to come out on top, I think is such a good, like middle finger to the Roy family. Um, but also it makes sense just based on the character development and kind of, um, him playing the game, right. And him kind of, um, doing the job saying he's he's gonna be a pain sponge um and i think um just i'm very proud of tom uh being kind of his number one fan being i've matthew mcfadden first of all wonderful job um i hope he gets kind of more roles in the future because also the fact that he's british is just crazy um and uh, and prejudice yeah and the fact that him and greg he they had like there but that moment where greg slaps him and everything but also the moment where he puts a sticker on his head and he's like i got you it's just such a because that bromance is amazing and since see, episode one it's true like he's had greg like he supported him since episode one so the fact that 
he still had him. I mean, Greg is going to be stuck in this endless pit of the middle for the rest of his life, the highest paid assistant in the world. Um, so not great for him, but at the same time, he, I don't think he was meant to be any more than that. But the fact that Tom was able to win the game by means of just being there um, and um, kissing as much ass as he could, um, I think, uh, and for Shiv, it's really sad, I think, because she's almost like, she's becoming what she hates in her mom, which is the wife of power, and kind of reverting back to the female like stereotype of the housewife almost um mm -hmm. with the kid carrying the kid and everything and i think for her it's very sad um but at the same time i think her coldness and her manipulative nature is kind of what led her to such an end right and i don't um and so for those reasons i think that also makes sense um and i think she also sacrificed a lot putting um taking kind of ken out of that power so yeah yeah I think, yeah, she was just groomed to like fight to survive. And that's, yeah. I guess, the cycle of abuse. They always, they, you know, they're bullshitters. They say things, but then they just dive into the same things. Nobody really changed. Let's talk about the performances. Oh, sorry. let's talk about the performances because, um, you know, Jeremy Strong, for example, in this season, I thought he did a terrific job of showing more of those characteristics of someone who just, um, who just needs that power and needs that status. And then in that final scene, when he's uh, walking to, uh, he's like walking there and he looks. And I thought that shot with the Statue of Liberty in the background was so symbolic because just in the previous episode, he made this speech about uh, America and the hands that keep the life forces going. And that's what he wanted for himself. That's what he's amounted his whole life to. And you can see just the face of like, a broken man. And I'd like that they ended it so ambiguously because now he has the choice of, uh, delving in his misery all his life or focusing on becoming a father but he's been raised to believe that I guess this toy of his this this job was all that he's amounted to in his life and so what Jesse Armstrong the writer says is that these couple years were the most interesting of his life and that he'll probably be miserable forever but it's, yeah. I like that they had that ambiguity for him that he has that choice that's really interesting you bring that up. I think you mentioned, like, I, I read that quote as well from, from Armstrong when he said um, these most interesting, like, these years. And I think almost when you, and it's very sad the way you think about this, is that these couple years, I think, is almost going to be, it's, like, never going to be like this again for any of the characters, right? Roman, Shiv, or Kendall. And so the fact that I feel like when you envision them in 20, 30 years, Waystar not even being a big part of their life and them thinking about kind of, I don't know, them... Uh, almost thinking about those couple of years is kind of like a, like a vivid, but longing memory. I think it's really and sad. And the brotherhood that was lost. Yeah, exactly. And I think, but for Roman, I think it's possibly, I think he might've had the best ending of the three, which is, which is hilarious. Cause I never thought that in a million years, but the mm -hmm. fact that now he's back where he started almost. And uh, he's like a kid at the bar again. And like, because remember at the beginning of succession, he didn't even work for Waystar. It was Logan who recruited him and said, hey, you might be, you know, good at this. I want you back. And so the fact that these characters now have to now um, Waystar is not going to be part of their life anymore. I think that's just think I about think it a lot. It was Jeremy Strong that said, I think he said it on the podcast that in that last scene, he wanted to jump. And yeah. then, uh, basically like, not for real, but like he himself, like in a way the character and i think i think he's right i think i liked it it was ambiguous mm -hmm. but i think that he he would have done it because i think for him that was everything um like that's what the show built up from minute one that's the only thing he ever wanted to do and being told that he would not be able to do it after his dad died and then losing his siblings and losing his kids and all that in like the same day. Uh, I think you, I think you'll do it honestly. I think he also had this great acting moment in the, when he was arguing with Rava uh, about whether or not the kids will go to the funeral where he suddenly became like imposing and threatening uh, to his ex-wife in a way that we hadn't seen from him before. Cause, um, because, like, whenever he was trying to seem, like, threatening towards his dad, like, I'm going to want to take down your empire or your reign of terror, it seemed like a child trying to be threatening. And here he was actually becoming, like, sort of threatening. 
and then that same episode, of course, Kieran Culkin uh, breaking down at the funeral, I thought was heartbreaking. And I think he's that's, that might even be the moment that wins him the Emmy this year for best mm. actor. We'll have to see. I agree. There's also that moment where they, the fight, the big fight in the, well, I, the last episode, you have the dichotomy of them. My favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes in the show, actually, now that I think about it, is when they're all like um, acting like kids again in the final episode, you know, when they're making drink, mm-hmm. Kendall drink that stuff. Um, and I, it's like the calm before the storm almost. It's, and it's aside from succession I've never seen before. And the fact that it came in the finale, like a genuine heartwarming moment, like no bullshit, yeah. like real, this is the real kind of shit. And I thought the juxtaposition between that and then we see later with them literally tearing, literally tearing each other to shreds, like Ro- Kendall's hands across like Roman's face, them like literally fighting each other. It's heartbreaking, but, um, and also that moment where Logan's singing with the old guard, um, like they have the video. That's the last moment we're going to see of Logan. Um, and I, when I thought about that during the episode, it was just. Yeah. And I, I love that everyone was together and mm-hmm. like all of them had this moment of like, camaraderie and all that seeing logan Mm -hmm. and um it's such it's a good like mirror as well compared to that um the living plus video that they saw of logan uh earlier (laughs) season where he was he was just the worst version of logan and right there he was being the best and um y'all remember yeah just the position of that was amazing do y'all remember what matson tweeted in the living plus episode it was the oh, yeah. concentration. Camp camp camp. Yeah. It was, and I love that he responded. He's very European. <laughs> Can we talk a sec about Alexander Skarsgård's performance? So good. I thought he did terrific. Oh my Playing God. this really so, like so good. eccentric. I love meeting him. He knows exactly. I don't, I don't think he knows what he's doing, but he's convinced that he knows what he's doing, that he can fire everyone. Oh, yeah. He he's just as bullshit as they are. Even uh, his PR um, had that uh-huh. awards. Like he never coded a day in his life. He's just, he just kind of got lucky. And um, when he tells yeah, Sarah Snook the like, story of how he sent, Apple he's like blood. the tech bro version of uh, the device. He's just as bullshit. I think he respected Logan because even though he was bullshit, he made his way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he kind of saw himself in that way because he yeah. also started with nothing, even if he was bullshit. He made that money. So I think that's yeah. why he didn't respect the kids because he was like, fuck these kids. They were born like with a golden spoon in their mouth. Yeah. I think, I like, yeah, he was, he was also scared of Logan, like a lot of people. Yeah. Um, sorry, go, go ahead. I, know, I was just going to say one thing. I felt like Skarsgård is kind of like if a cult leader became a tech bro. That's what the performance gave off. I loved it. I thought he was so good. He's Alexander Skarsgård. Just a quick appreciation moment for him because first he's one of my favorite actors in the world right now. I can't wait to see what he does in the future. That family is just incredibly talented. But um, like everything from Succession to Big Little Lies, which is his performance that is just like insane. If you haven't checked out the show, performance. watch it right away. Um, Northman, like everything, everything in between, everything as stupid as Godzilla versus Kong. Like he does it. <laughs> the guy does everything, and he's just such a talented, charismatic actor. Oh, shit. And the fact that he made, I hated Matson. I hated him. And so the fact that Scarlett Regard was able to do that because I love the guy so much. If you see him in interviews, he seems like the most lovable, lovable guy in the world. Um, it's just a testament to how good he is. Kind of like Logan and him won uh, the, the game. Not really Tom. Like Tom is going to be the successor. But I think it's pretty clear that like, Tom didn't actually win. Like he's... He's going to be mad in the beach, basically. Don't take the win away from me. <laughs> Don't take away the win from Tom. Don't. But he still gets to live a king's life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's going to, he's going to be... For Tom, like it's, and he keeps That's Greg, what Tom too. loved the most. Yeah, he keeps Greg. He keeps Greg as the highest paid assistant in the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like For him, it's the perfect situation because he doesn't want the actual responsibility, but he wants the looks. He wants the... Like the vibe. Um, That's what he all, loves. He's a, he's a figurehead. Uh, or, or sorry, Madsen, he's basically, he's, 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 he wanted, that's why I, another reason he didn't want Shiv is because that's not, he wanted, he didn't want so many, he said it with so many ideas, with so many kind of, he didn't, he, he, he still wanted to be in charge, but he wanted, he wanted more of a CEO. What he wanted more of a CEO was someone who could, I guess, again, be the sponge for all of that American 
criticism <laughs> and all the media criticism. Which, and, which is what Tom already was in ATM. Yeah, exactly. Well. It's, yeah, exactly. Well. So, yeah, he was perfect for the world. Remember when he, he was going to go to prison. jail? Remember, exactly. Yeah. He was about to go to jail, man. He was In season he three, he was in the so lowest great. like part of his life. And now yeah, for and him that's to be the level high. of a pain sponge that he is. Yeah. He's willing to go to jail to keep that, uh, to keep like the most powerful Kiss people ass. in the world. And uh, he's good race. So, yeah. I think McFadden's best performance moment might have been when he tells Shiv, you are not a good person to have children oh. with. That, and that you can see how much that cuts so deep for, for Shiv. Uh, because they're saying such bad things to each other. But when he says, like, you're maybe not a good person to have children with. And she's just like, like man, that I scene, think that was brilliant. There's there's two but lines. I love yeah. also when they're on the, the scene phone. The scene was so cathartic. Um, for, uh, in this episode, when they're on the phone and she still thinks she's going to be CEO. Um, so she's calling him and she's asking him for a chance for, like, uh, for them to build up their mm. family again. And I love that he says no. He's like, no, I, I don't know if I want that. Like, I think that was as much of a power play as what he did with uh, Madsen. I feel like Tom, by the end, became the best player, like, easily. Yeah. Out, he wants her to be the puppy dog. Because he's been her, sort of, like, coming back to her as the puppy in the, the earlier seasons. Because she was and just like, she I want to pull it role by the end of the show like mm -hmm. he he puts his hand and he's like you have nowhere else to go and she's like yeah i don't so she I also she want to shout out that. that shot of them in the taxi for me it was like a king and the queen king and queen almost like the way it maybe it was just me that kind of got that vibe but the way his hand was there and then hers was kind of on top but they weren't yeah. like holding hands it was in him tom kind of looking off that moment also when tom's like walks into the building and then they have the music i we haven't talked about the music yet um but the, when they have Bertel's score yeah. like they, it's like the main theme playing you're like oh shit um but also like yeah sorry go ahead um so yeah, we'll get to this i also wanted to shout out a really great performance um and that's james cromwell in the in the funeral when he makes that speech and a detail that was pointed out by someone was that when Logan's swimming in the therapy episode in season one, he has scars on his back mm -hmm. because the theme of the show is a cycle of abuse. And when he finally, uh, when he finally reveals what had happened to Logan is that like his aunt and uncle abused him and made him feel guilty over their daughter's death. That reveal was just like a jaw drop for me because mm. it was like a whole new side of Logan. And James Cromwell is like, because you in it, Again, he's very rich and he'll do what he wants, but he genuinely had resentment for all of them. And he's trying to reckon with the the love slash resentment for his brother. And he ends it with Godspeed. Uh, I thought that was such an esteemed performance. And the other one I want to shout out is Harriet Walter. Uh, the last two episodes is Caroline, because I think she she also has amazing one-liners. She comes up at, in, at the end of every season and just does a lot of damage. And I think she's also fantastic. She's, she's also worst, a very cold she's person. She's a good like yeah Dude, character. When she gathered like, guys, like, like all the all the former all the former lovers of Logan, and then she told she was like, oh that she was my Carrie, um to uh to Marsha. I was like, Oof. but also now that we're shouting out performances, <laughs> Peter Friedman, Dave Rash, and Fisher Stevens who play Hugo, uh, Carl, and Frank. I mean, oh, the scene, if there is a scene stealer that I've ever seen one, it's Hugo number. Hugo has at least like one no, funny, Carl. Like funny line for him. Carl and Frank. I mean, oh, come on. Carl and Frank. I mean, they're just amazing. They're just so good. And they're like small moments. Um, I think like one of the best scenes in this, uh, in this uh, season was when uh, all of them were really uncomfortable in that sauna. And Frank yes. and Carl were just sitting outside. That's a meme now. It's a gift now. That that, that just <laughs> hanging. <laughs> shot. They're like, we're not going in there. You're insane. There's a bunch of like naked Europeans. I, I'm convinced that like there's some improvising because they made some of the best comments. Frank and Carl. They were like, so funny. Carl would just sometimes come into the room with a smile and just say like the funniest, most savage. <laughs> Remember when uh, he said that he had that like intense moment with um with with uh, Kendall before the living plus announcement and then after the announcement was made and then it did really well carl was like i knew we could do it i knew and he's like clapping for him <laughs> it was so good. and then also we didn't talk about him connor and willa um alan rock who plays connor 
oh my god the con heads the uh the announcement spe- the oh, speech the speech at the end con heads i salute you <laughs> Because that's the I thing really now. Want, I know this is so unrealistic, but I really wanted him to win the presidency. I wanted him to win so bad. <laughs> I thought he would win at the end of the show. I thought it would end with like like this apocalyptic thing. And then, also, it's a thing now in every election when someone loses yeah. and they're like, okay, my followers, get ready to do something yeah. terrible. Like, con heads, get ready. We're coming. Like, <laughs> He's, like, I love Connor. So overall thoughts, and I think we, we can, I can say pretty easily that all of us love the finale which is something really hard for a tv show to do because even in shows that i love like game of thrones how i met your mother a bunch of others the finale is always like so contentious but i feel like here everyone agrees that not everyone because that's always a problem but like most people agree that it was a great finale i think you know if you look at some of the best series finale I didn't expect it to have this emptiness, this coldness to it that just like destroyed me. But I love that they did that. You know, if you look at the finale of um, of Better Call Saul, which ended recently, there's also like this this loss in it. Um, or some of the best, like I like that this one wasn't this dragged out aftermath of where everyone ended up. It's just you find the successor and then boom, it ends like that. And I, I think it is something that I don't think I've ever seen a series finale do with that. The way it ended, I've been thinking about it ever since I saw it two days ago, and I just think this is the the best way they could have ended it with that intensity, with that savagery, and I think they ended it on a high. Like you said, a lot of series finales happening now. I still need to finish up Ted Lasso, and I finished Marvelous Mrs. Maisel a couple of days before. Also, solid ending. Um, but yeah, Succession was a show to die for. Uh, definitely Sarah Snook is winning the Emmy, Kieran Culkin, Jeremy Strong, it's going to be a hard match. I think they've overtaken Bob Odenkirk, Pedro Pascal, whoever's else is in the and race. And Brian Cox. And then, I don't know. And Brian Cox, probably, because um, he's not in it that much, of course, in, uh, compared to other seasons. And then um, in terms of the best drama show, it's going to be tough, but I think Succession will prevail again, even above uh, The White Lotus and Better Call Saul and House of the Dragon, etc. It's going to be a big kind of marathon, like not not like a sprint to the finish line, but a marathon for succession on the award circuit, uh, which should be which should be a lot of fun to see. Um, and I think in the, terms of yeah, the easiest bet is, uh, is Roman. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, because uh, I, I yeah. like whenever I'm seeing the buzz post succession for every episode, it's always a Kieran Culkin moment. It's always a Roman moment, whether it's the uh, the thing with the. Um, on the street with the protesters or, you know, the, the thing at the funeral or kind of anything he does, like at the election, whenever it hated him, it's always Karen Culkin. Also the first season, if you look at it, it wasn't nominated for as many awards things as the next two were, but Kieran Culkin was already getting in for supporting actor stuff. He was the first thing that the awards girls were recognizing, which is interesting. Yeah. And Jeremy won last year, right? He won for season yeah. two. And Brian the Golden Cox Globe for season three. three. For Emmys. Maybe it was. Oh, no. They both lost season? to Lee Jung Jae for Squid Game last year. Oh, I love Squid Game, but nah. Yeah, but but nah, yeah. Definitely not a but Brian Cox won Golden Globe for season two and Jeremy Strong for season three. And then Jeremy Strong got Emmy for season two. I think she might have a good chance as Star Snook as well. I hope so. I think because she's in lead actress, there's no one else that's really as big and as talked about. Also, just as a character archetype, Matthew McFadden might do it again for supporting actor, uh, especially the journey that Tom took. Unless, you know, I was thinking maybe uh, it would be Patty Constantine for House of the Dragon for a while, but it looks like they're putting him in lead. So. Yeah. I think Matthew oh, McFadden's an easy bet. Oh, I didn't know that. That's what I saw, but maybe, I don't know. I don't think that's wise. But yeah. I also think Matthew McFadden, Tom being CEO at the end, helps Matthew McFadden with his chances a lot. Yeah, I agree. For supporting actor. But I think there's also a real chance that Alexander Skarsgård might get for supporting. Yeah. He won. Did he win he, guest actor? In I don't know. That's Surrey? a good question. I think he might have. Him or Adrian Brody, maybe. I forgot. But I think this he would be now? supporting. He wouldn't be a guest star. Yeah, know, now he's, he's guest. Almost every sorry, episode. Now he's supporting, yeah. And more than Dry- Brian Cox, even though he's being put in lead still. <laughs> okay, oh, last so year was Coleman Domingo for Euphoria. Ratings? 
There you go. So let's do some ratings for Succession. Let's do it differently this time because it's the first time we're uh, reviewing a show that ended. Um, I want a rating for the show itself and for the finale. So let's start with our guest. 10 out of 10 for the now finale. And for the show, I can't give a number, so I'll just give an animal. I'll give a goat. <laughs> Fantastic. It doesn't, a no. number is too, like, animal. Yeah. yeah, you know, like we said, very poetic that um there was a there was a thing let me just say this there was a very there was a thing about how tom's last name wamsgans means something that has to do with like a triple play um and so like that's how like he hints at the ending but i was like no wamsgans w he takes the w so that's what's poetic about it but no um i thought it was a beautiful series finale especially like you said there was the comfort at the end but you felt like it was the calm before the storm and the way those la that last half hour played out from that moment that Tom says, it's going to be me to how to Kendall sitting there. I think the finale is at the end of 10 out of 10. It's also elevated by uh, Harriet Walter being in it. Um, I will say that. And just all the dynamics, uh, Tom and Greg, etc. And then the final season as a whole is also a 10 out of 10, just because every episode managed to distinguish itself, managed to surprise, managed to take turns. Uh, you were either at this big wedding or you were in Sweden um, or, you know, at the tailgate party, you had this argument with uh, Sarah Snook and Matthew McFadden um, and you felt the scale. Again, Helmer shouted out Nicholas Bertel for this score. I listen to that shit all the time now. So, yeah, 10 out of 10 both ways. Great. Uh, I think I'm going the same way as both of you guys. Uh, I... I honestly didn't think the finale would be a 10 out of 10 because how finales usually are. But I guess the joke's on me for uh, uh, doubting this I'm strong. Um, so yeah, it's a 10 out of 10 for me for the finale. Uh, 10 over a 10 for the season and a 10 out of 10 for the show. So uh, triple 10s uh, for <laughs> success. Triple play, one uh, yeah, I, think, I think this might be my favorite show of the 2010s. It's my favorite show of all know, time. So maybe maybe my better, but for now throw it, it from the for the twenty tens. It's actually because remember you had a video where you asked me to send in what's my favorite show of all time. Yeah. And I had a couple that I was thinking yeah. about. And I, I ended up going with succession. And, and yeah. since then I felt confident that it is. And yeah. this season more than solidified that. Yeah, we we put succession for anyone else. Like this is before season four. So we were the OGs. Yeah. Everyone else is saying, Oh, it's it me, might you not and be a Chris. Bad, like one of the it might be up there with Breaking Bad's promise. I'm like, no, no, no. That was already up there. Now it's just surpassed them. So I want to thank our our dear old guest, Alex, the host Helmer. Uh like God working people. Uh, Sorry, Alex, where can people find you? Uh, first of all, thank you, Golf, for member TLC Productions. Uh, you're the first person to kind of uh, say us with the new username, so thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think I've still been telling people on our channel to follow us at the League of Cinephiles, so I think <laughs> I, even I'm behind the, the eight ball a bit. Uh, but, yeah, follow us at TLC Productions on Instagram. Subscribe on YouTube at the League of Cinephiles as well. Nice. That's why I tell Gal to always introduce our guests. He never fucks <laughs> up. Uh, I would fuck up. So yeah, so yeah, find us at Film Fanatics Pod. And special thanks to um, Jesse Armstrong, Mark Mylod, Jeremy Strong, Sarah Snook, Matthew McFadden, Kieran Culkin, and crew for giving us a wonderful hour to talk and rave and converse about this work of art. Yeah, and remember to follow us in our in our accounts right here, Film Toppings, Film Fanatic Spot, uh, and of course, TLC Productions. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Film Fanatics. Film Fanatics. From the silver screen to your earphones with Alan Azulay and Gal Balaban.